uh, speaker series on the ethics of argumentation. Um, um, our fourth talk today is going to be um, given by uh, Dr. Michael Morell on um, in defense of empathy. Uh, before we start the talk, um, let me just say, first of all, um, the talk itself, though not the question period, is video recorded, which makes it even more important that everybody makes sure that their microphone is turned off during the talk. Um, um, and, and after the talk, we will have a question period. Uh, what has worked well for us in the past is that if you have a question, just kind of type your name or the word question or something into the chat that indicates to us moderators that you want to ask a question. You can even start typing those things into the chat during the talk because that won't be recorded and that way we have kind of a natural order of things. Um, and now uh, let me introduce our wonderful speaker. Dr. Michael Morell is an associate professor of political science at the University of Connecticut. Um, where he specializes in political theory um, and political psychology. And his research is in deliberative democracy, which connects him directly to you know, the ethics of argumentation, including the roles of emotion and deliberation and empathy in democracy. And that is what he's going to talk about to us now, um, defense of empathy. Uh, take it away, Michael. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I want to thank Andrew and uh, Katarina for organizing this series, and especially Kat uh, for her patience in my all, all too often slow response to her many emails. She was very patient with me, and I really appreciate that. And I want to say up front, I, I've looked at who you've already had speaking, and you've had uh, certainly much better scholars than I am in the series. Um, and so what I'm going to present today is in, in some ways in its early stages, uh, although the foundation of the material that I'll present is something I've been working with for quite a long time and have some pretty clear ideas uh, about the defense, which is in the title and defense of empathy is in the very early stages. And I'm still unsure if I'm going to be able to be successful in that defense. I think so. I hope so. And I would love to um, uh, get your thoughts on that. So I hope to contribute something interesting and helpful to the series. Uh, and perhaps you can help me figure out uh, whether or not uh, empathy is defensible. So I want to first give a little bit of a context to my thinking about empathy. So why should we think about empathy? And I want to ask excuses up front for the fairly US-centric examples I'm going to give. But I think these examples, we could find similar ones across the world. So for example, following the unexpected 2016 elections in the United States, there were numerous calls for the need and the desire to listen to the citizens who had voted for President Trump and trying to understand them. Um, during the first impeachment of President Trump, for example, on January 25th, 2020 in the New York Times, Nicholas Kristof asked uh, the readers to engage in a thought experiment. And that experiment was, what if it were President Barack Obama who was the subject of the Senate impeachment trial? How would we feel then? Um, one of the many traits that people cite as important, for example, to President Biden's success is his ability to empathize that, that arises from his uh, tragic personal history. And as we watch the trial uh, this week of, of the, the murder of George Floyd, um, one cannot help but consider uh, the, the, the way in which the very uh, images that uh, presented uh, that situation to us invoked a kind of empathy and how important that was to understanding the fate of uh, African Americans in their uh, interactions with the police. And I think if we look historically, uh, especially in the United States with African Americans, we could see other examples as well. So I think empathy is an important thing to discuss. Now, um, I'm coming at this, as you could see uh, on your screen, you could see my book from 2010. Um, I'm coming at this specifically, as Katarina said, from the perspective of a deliberative Democrat. And so my investigations tend to be primarily within that context of deliberative democracy. And as such, what drives my thinking here um, is that there is a promise that is inherent in any democratic kind of system we have. And that is that decisions that a society will use its collective power to enforce must give equal consideration to everyone in the community. And so that's kind of the foundation foundational kind of principle that drives a lot of my thinking in this area. Now, despite this, I do think that empathy is likely to be extremely important in 
other contexts where we have to have equal consideration, including legal and ethical contexts. And I, so I do think that what I'm going to speak about is important uh, to, to the theme of this series. Um, but I just want you to know up front kind of where my central kind of focus is. And I want to note that although I am not an argumentation scholar, I did participate in competitive academic debate uh, as a uh, both in my high school years and in my college years. Uh, and while I'm old enough now that much of what I learned uh, from that time period has now escaped my synapses a bit, uh, I think I do have a sufficient understanding or at least a basic rudimentary understanding of argumentation theory and rhetoric theory, uh, and that what I'm going to present about deliberation does relate. Uh, to the ethics of argumentation. So with that context in mind, I'm going to tell you, we're, this is the way we're going to go. First of all, I'm going to talk a little bit about empathy itself. What is empathy? Um, and I'm going to assume that most of you have never studied empathy in depth. If you have, please forgive uh, me going over this, but I think it's important to establish what empathy is and, and specifically how I conceptualize empathy. Then we'll talk about some of the problems with empathy. Uh, that is the critiques that have arisen recently and in recent years against empathy. And then I will provide my uh, preliminary defense of empathy and its role in a demo deliberative democratic society. I'll end with, though, uh, as, as you will see, there's an interesting, a coda called More Problems with Empathy, and I'll explain why it's a coda uh, when we get to that uh, end. So what exactly is empathy? Well, empathy has, uh, this is a complicated question. Um, some, some psychologists that study empathy famously have written, uh, Nancy Eisenberg and Janet Strayer said that, quote, because of its wide ranging application, the notion of empathy is and always has been a broad, somewhat slippery concept, one that has provoked considerable speculation, excitement, and confusion. Uh, Jonathan Levy goes, goes even further and argues that, quote, the word empathy has been troublesome since it entered the language of psychology and psychiatry. So empathy has had a difficult history. And, and the reasons for that, I'm going to explain to you and explain. And I think this helps us, uh, helps me do some of my defense of empathy. And that's why I want to explain it, I, other than I think it's kind of interesting. So empathy actually, what becomes empathy, the, what we, the word empathy begins in Germany, interestingly enough, Einfühlung, and it was in German aesthetics. So it originally was proposed um, <clears throat> by people who were, by, by philosophers who were trying to understand aesthetic appreciation. And it literally is feeling in or feeling into. And even though it was around for, in various ways for a while, it was really Robert Vischer who named it in his dissertation written in 1872 and published a year later. And this is what he said, quote, thus I project my own life into the lifeless form, just as I quite justifiably do with another living person. Only ostens ostensibly do I keep my identity, although the object remains distinct. I seem merely to adapt and attach myself to it as one hand clasps another, and yet I am mysteriously transplanted and magically transformed into this other. So this is where the very beginnings of this idea uh, begin to take shape in terms of how, what's going to become empathy later on. <clears throat> And this is picked up by Theodore Lips as well, and he used it in his two aesthetics, and he starts to move it even closer to what we think of as empathy. Now, not surprisingly, since it began in Germany, uh, this idea uh, is picked up by psychoanalysts, and specifically through Freud, um, which you can see on your screen. And Freud takes up the concept of Einfühlung um, in aspects of his psychoanalytic theories, and he is likely, uh, from my research, the first one to specifically attach it to human beings. So this is where we see it start to translate over to human beings. For example, he writes, quote, another suspicion may tell us that we are far from having exhausted the problem of identification and that we are faced by the process which psychology calls Einfühlung and which plays the largest part in our understanding of what is inherently foreign to our ego in other people. And this idea uh, of projection and its ability to, to understand other people. You can see why this might be important to psychoanalysis. And in the psychotherapy of the 20th century, this more cognitively oriented, oriented idea of empathy is the one that holds sway. 
At the same time, however, we get the actual translation of Einfühlung into the word empathy uh, by a sociologist by the name of Edward B. Titchener. And he first uses it as a translation of Einfühlung during a series of lectures he gave at the University of Illinois in 1909. And this is what he said, quote, not only do I see gravity and modesty and pride and courtesy and stateliness, but I feel or act them in my mind's muscles. This is, I suppose, a simple case of empathy, if we may coin that term as a rendering of Einfühlung. There is nothing curious or idiosyncratic about it, but it is a fact that must be mentioned. And Titchener himself said, he, he admits that he translated the word, uh, some people think unfortunately, but he translated the word empathy by relying on the Greek word empatheia, meaning in suffering or passion, and he formed it on an analogy with sympathy. So before 1909, in the English language, we have no word called empathy. So if you look at any thinkers but before this, it doesn't exist. And so we run into the word sympathy in his. Um, so some people argue they wish he would have just kept sympathy and it might have made a lot of our understanding easier, but he didn't. And so empathy enters the language and begins to be used in this kind of way uh, in the English speaking world. And this gets picked up in social and developmental psychology in the 1960s. And because of their own kinds of uh, ideas about empathy and, and their, their concerns or questions about, you know, individual psychology and development, um, their version focuses much more on this matching of affect and less emphasis on projection or understanding. And some of this, I think, arises from their they had a need to measure empathy and it's much more it's much more simple to measure empathy if we define it in this kind of affective matching um, whether it's the exact same emotion or a valence emotion uh, and so in social developmental psychology we use the word in this sort of way of, of, of matching affect so this explains why empathy is such a difficult and slippery concept. We have so many different ways that it's being used. Now, I argue that we do have some key components here, although some people stress one component over another. And these key components are emotions or affect, some form of projection, and, and this is the one that falls out in social development psychology, but on my reading is very, very important, is some form of understanding. And because of the, the various uses, this confusion over the, the, these various uses, there's been an attempt that was made um, to a different approach in understanding empathy. And that approach is a multidimensional approach. Um, and the first person to really uh, develop this fully, I think, um, was Mark H. Davis. And he named this multidimensional model that he came up with that attempted to grapple with the various affective and cognitive, both processes of empathy and the results of empathy. He called it the organizational model. So this model is affective. There's no doubt that, that emotion plays an important role in it, but it is not just affective. Um, affect remains a key component, but this reminds us that empathy, even though in kind of its common usages, as often people say, I feel empathy, that never really happens. Empathy is not an emotion itself, right? Empathy can lead to emotions like, uh, you know, concern or uh, pity or distress, but empathy is not an emotion. Rather, empathy is um, a process. And I argue that we should conceive of empathy as a process whereby the situation and emotions of others create affective and cognitive responses in observers. And while Davis calls his model the organizational model, I've kind of adapted that. And I argue instead that we should call this the process model of empathy. And you can see it on the screen. And I'm not going to go into this too much. I can talk about it more later if you, if you want. But it really tries to capture the complex nature of empathy, that it has antecedents, those things that precede the process happening that have an effect on empathy, that there are various processes through which empathy can happen, and then it can lead to various outcomes, both affective intrapersonal outcomes, we feel or, or emotions that are the same or similar, but then we also can have things like concern for others or anger at injustice and those sorts of uh, outcomes that the others aren't necessarily feeling. We 
We also get non-effective interpersonal outcomes, and these will be very important in my discussion a little bit later, and then also some interpersonal outcomes. And not all of these outcomes are positive. Uh, personal distress, as you will see, and aggression can occur, um, but most of them are positive, and the key ones that are positive are why I think uh, empathy is important. And so now we can understand that the model, you could see that empathy's importance focuses a lot on the interpersonal uh, non-effective in many ways outcome. I think the effective outcomes are important as well and they, they are part of the process, but it really is the non-effective outcomes. And I'm gonna talk about uh, four of these. The first one is what we call attribution bias. Now, some of you may be familiar with attribution bias, but I'll just explain it real quickly. So we have good evidence that actors, when they judge their own actions, um, they often attribute the source of those actions differently than when they judge the actions of others. And you might not be too surprised about this, that when your action is successful, uh, actors tend to attribute to uh, the, you know, their own abilities, right? Their own behaviors, their controllable dispositions. When they're not successful, they tend to attribute it to situational factors, factors that are outside their control. For examples, if students do really well on an exam, of course, it's because they worked hard or they're very intelligent, their personal dispositions, right? Um, while if they don't do well on exam, of course, it's the difficulty of the test or the unreasonable, um, you know, nature of the professor or the professor didn't teach things well enough or they had to work too late the night before. All of these are what we call situational factors. And so actors tend to, to do this kind of attribution. But of course, when they look at others, they tend to look at it much more differently. Um, they tend to attribute others' success on average um, to situations. Oh, they just, they got lucky or they were born with certain advantages. And when they don't, aren't successful, they oftentimes tend to uh, attribute those uh, lacks of success to some sort of personal failing on the part of the person. Now, you could see why this might be problematic for deliberation uh, and for understanding and for listening. And again, I think it also would be very important for uh, lots of forms of argumentation that might take place. The, the uh, good thing is, is that we do have evidence that various parts of this empathic process, uh, whether it is predispositions to empathy or attempts to induce empathy, can help overcome or mitigate this attribution bias. That is, especially if we ask people to, to, to think about what they are, what, uh, what the situation is for the other person, that tends to mitigate, not completely erase it, but it tends to mitigate this tendency to be biased in our attributions. A second kind of bias, and that's really important, is outgroup evaluations. Now, research demonstrates a generally consistent relationship between uh, empathy uh, of various types, like I said, either predispositions to empathy among individuals or attempts to induce empathy in various sorts of ways and outgroup evaluation. Although, to be honest, the empirical evidence in this area is a little more complex. What is it? What processes are most likely to lead to this? Uh, there's some mixed evidence on that. But overall, the evidence leans towards the idea that empathy does uh, affect outgroup evaluations. For example, Davis et al. found that if you give affective role-taking instructions, that is, imagine what it's like to feel uh, regarding the other person, that people uh, would tend to ascribe traits to a member of a stigmatized group similar to the way they ascribe tra traits to themselves, especially positive traits. Um, another example is Galinsky and, and Moskowitz in 2000. They indicate that giving general perspective taking, so this is not just affective, it's general, can increase positive outgroup evaluations and decrease stereotyping over a greater period of time than if you really try to engage them in stereotype suppression. And part of the argument they make there is stereotype, when you try to engage in stereotype uh, suppression explicitly, right, that tends to make them hypersensitive to stereotypes, where if, if you engage in this kind of process of empathy, it, it's less likely to lead to that. Um, so 
those that's just a couple of examples that we can see. Um, there are many others uh, that that various components of the process of empathy in de in decrease this bias, uh, out group bias. A third set of, of studies, and there, there's very few of these, and, and I really should go back to this probably, and I haven't been able to, uh, relates to specifically deliberative democracy. The most famous of which is Diana Mutz's study, uh, which examines the effects of empathic predispositions. So she's looking at predispositions, uh, those things that come before empathy, on openness to others' arguments, and uh, concludes that, quote, those in, in higher perspective taking ability, or for those in high perspective taking ability, mean levels of tolerance were higher when subjects were exposed to rationales for dissonant views. However, among those low in perspective taking ability, tolerance levels were lower when subjects were exposed to dissonant views. Although she says there's a lot more variance among that group and that makes all her findings suggestive. But the basic idea is that uh, those who have, are predisposed to empathy are more likely to listen to other people during deliberation. And I find some similar evidence uh, myself and, and an undergraduate student of mine from a long time ago, an honor student, uh, we, we worked some experiments that provided some evidence that deliberate groups where you have members composed of these high empathic uh, people, these people with high predispositions to empathy are much more likely to display mutual respect and open-mindedness during face-to-face -face, uh, deliberation. So we have a good set of empirical evidence that empathy can overcome biases that would be destructive to any sort of treating citizens as equal and that it can also in deliberation probably uh, open people up to those with whom they disagree. I think there's a fourth argument that I want to throw out here, and this is more of a theoretical argument. It draws on this, but I also think that understanding is something that results from empathy. Um, the process of empathy can help people understand one another in ways that I think are vital, and I argue theoretically vital, if we want to make sure that uh, we give citizens equal consideration. So you might think with all this great evidence and with this wonderfully watertight argument that I give that uh, everyone would say, oh yes, uh, Michael, you are absolutely right. That all makes sense. But of course, that's not the way things work, right? And so in the past several years, we've seen quite a few people start to argue um, that uh, there are problems with empathy. And the first one I wanna talk about is Paul Bloom, who very famously in 2016 published a book called Against Empathy. And in this art book, Bloom points to several primary interrelated reasons that empathy should not be part of our moral thinking. So I do need to acknowledge that Bloom's argument is specifically about ethics and moral decision making, although he does link it to public policy as well. And so I think it's it's kind of in the same vein of, of what we, you know, I talk about and in the same vein of, of what might be of interest to, to this to, to, the, to this workshop. And so what are these problems with empathy? Well, the first problem that Bloom identifies is what I call empathy as spotlight. He calls it a spotlight, but that's what I kind of used to, to do the title of it. Um, so he says that empathy has a narrow focus and can lead to unintended consequences uh, in very specific situations. As he writes, quote, but spotlights have a narrow focus, and this is one problem with empathy. It does poorly in a world where there are many people in need and where the effects of one's actions are diffuse, often delayed, and difficult to compute. A world in which an act that helps one person in the here and now can lead to greater suffering in the future. So one problem that, that Bloom talks about is that empathy provides a spotlight on one thing but ignores everything else. A second problem is the bias nature of empathy. And Bloom argues, uh, contrary to a lot of what I've been saying, Bloom argues that empathy reflects rather than overcomes our biases, which means it is a poor basis for more, making moral decisions. So he writes, quote, further spotlights and this is related to the spotlight argument. Further spotlights only illuminate what they are pointed out, so empathy reflects our biases. Intellectually, a white American might believe that a black person matters just as much as a white person, but he or she will typically find it a lot easier to empathize with the plight of the latter than the former. 
In this regard, empathy distorts our moral judgments in pretty much the same way that prejudice does. So he claims that these biases can often lead us to favor those who are uh, like us or who, who or those who we like. And therefore, when we engage in empathy, we might actually be making things worse, right? And we might be uh, increasing inequalities. And I want to note in this argument, he, he cites several studies by a, a psychologist named Daniel C. Batson, who's going to come up later as well. And Batson um, has some studies that demonstrate that if you in, induce empathy in people for a particular individual, that then people will engage in behaviors that even they see as unjust and unfair. And they will, for example, there was one study where they looked at uh, a list of children that were in need and, and they induced empathy for one of the children in, in the experimental treatment. And then most people in that experimental treatment on average would raise that uh, child up the list in terms of who was gonna get help. Even though they recognized that the list had already been set based upon people's needs and they recognized, they argued to some degree that that was unfair and unjust. So he uses that as a, as a strong example of how empathy can lead to these sorts of biases that actually go against the very equal consideration that I think is important and that we all think that most of us think is important in a democracy. The third one, and again, these are all kind of interrelated, but I want to name this specifically is what he calls enumeracy. And he writes, quote, empathy is limited as well in that it focuses uh, right on specific individuals its spotlight nature renders it innumerate and myopic it doesn't resonate properly to the flex of our actions on groups of people and it is insensitive to statistical data and estimated costs and costs and benefits so one of the key arguments here that bloom is trying to make is that empathy you know focuses on this either one or very small number of people and it ignores the decisions that uh, of larger groups it can't deal with the you know issues ethical and public policy ethical decisions and public policy <clears throat> and so in the end he argues that it's much better to have what he calls quote rational compassion um, and he says, quote, intellectually, we can value the lives of all these individuals. We can give them weight when we make decisions, but we, what we can't do is empathize with all of them. Indeed, you cannot empathize with more than one or two people at the same time. And so instead of empathy, he says we should have a system of rational compassion. Now, Bloom is not the only one uh, that has come after empathy. Uh, there's even more problems with empathy, as I say here, right? And that's uh, the, the, the main person I want to talk about here is Mary Scudder, Molly Scudder. Um, and so while Bloom focuses on ethical decision making, although, as I said, he leaks over into public policy in doing so, uh, Scudder focuses specifically on deliberation. And, and so she raises several concerns she has about what she sees as the problems with empathy, and she uh, engages with my work and, and some work of some other uh, political theorists such as Sharon Krause um, that are really uh, kind of the center of the people that are arguing for the importance of empathy and deliberation. Now, the first uh, crit major critique that she has is uh, called selective empathy. Uh, that's what she calls this. And this critique really parallels in some way the discussion of spotlighting and bias in Bloom. Although she specifically argues uh, uh, by going beyond Bloom. So remember, Bloom says we should have rational compassion. And, and, and he does at certain points call that kind of a cognitive empathy. But she rejects empathy altogether. Not just the kind of affective thing that Bloom uh, did, critiques, but also the cognitively oriented empathy. And she cites several of the empirical studies uh, that are out there, just as Bloom does, that demonstrate that people are selective in their empathizing. They do so much more easily with people that are like them, or people who are similar to them, or people that they like. And therefore, she concludes from this evidence, quote, the selective nature of empathy makes it an unlikely corrective to problems of selective listening and exclusion in deliberation. The second major critique that she has of empathy and democracy is projection bias. Um, and this is another bias, but it's slightly different, right? Uh, 
And I think this is really one of her major, major concerns, uh, given what she writes and given some conversations that we have had about this. And this occurs when we mistakenly thinking we have understood the situation of others after engaging the process of empathy, but instead have projected our own understandings of the world onto others. So we may think we've done empathy. So we've held empathy up as a standard. We've tried to do it and we think we've done it. But in in fact, what we've really done is projected our own emotions, our own understandings onto the other person. So as Scudder writes, quote, not only are our attempts at perspective taken off and biased, resulting in misguiding empathic concern or empathic misunderstanding, but in practice, these attempts have the potential to truncate deliberation itself. That is, we've done the empathy and we understand the situation and now we can just make a decision. So these are two of the major kinds of uh, people that have, risen, uh, have brought up problems with empathy and those are kind of the major problems they've identified. Now, I have several defenses that I wanna lay out here. And again, this is early, but I think um, these defenses uh, I think are persuasive, but we'll see how persuasive they are. So first, I mean, I understand why he did this, right? If you write a book called uh, For Empathy, everyone, there's there's kind of an, okay, yeah, we're all for empathy. That's that's not likely to get a lot of attention. If you write a book called Against Empathy, right? Everyone, what are you against empathy, right? It, it, it is something that, that sounds interesting. Um, but I'm not convinced that Bloom is really against empathy uh, and, and that he's actually in much more in favor of it than he admits. Our, our earlier discussion of the history of empathy shows why defining empathy is complicated. Um, and I think this is why he could, uh, you know, in the end, write a book against empathy that still defends what he calls rational compassion. So Bloom's critiques rely heavily on a definition of empathy that limits the concept specifically to feeling what others feel. And he often refers to empathy as one among several gut feelings that we have. And he contrasts this with what he calls cognitive empathy. That is, he writes, quote, but there is another sense of empathy, or to put it differently, another facet of empathy. There is the capacity to understand what's going on in other people's head, to know what makes them tick, and what gives them joy and pain, and what they see as humiliating or ennobling. We're not talking here about me feeling your pain, but rather about me understanding that you are in pain without necessarily experiencing of any of it myself. Am I against this sort of cognitive empathy as well? I couldn't be. If you see the morality in terms of the consequences of our actions, and everyone sees it that way, this way, at least in part, then it follows that being a good moral agent requires an understanding of how people work. So thus, Bloom is only against empathy of a very certain sort. So he ends up basically arguing that we should not base our moral decisions and public policies on gut feelings that empathy invokes, um, but we have to have this rational compassion. But of course, there's no one that I know of, I mean, maybe they are out there, but there's no one that I know of that defends empathy in this kind of sort of way, that we should really make these decisions purely on the base of these sort of gut feelings. And he even cites some evidence to separate these two out from neurobiology by Zaki and Uxner. And since I'm running a little long, I'm not going to get into this too deeply because it's a bit of inside baseball. But in the end, the evidence that he cites, I think, demonstrates that the multidimensional models, such as Davis's model and myself, are a much better way to conceive of it, that those gut feelings inform the process that we engage in when it comes to empathy. Both Bloom and Scudder cite evidence of the biases in empathy. That is, we naturally empathize more readily with people that are like us and people that we like. And there's no denying this. There's good evidence out there. If left all to, to themselves, right, that people just tend to empathize with people that are like them or that they like or that they have some connection to. I, I don't uh, disagree with the evidence, but I do disagree with the implications. And, and here's why. The choice we face, I argue, is not whether to have empathy or not, right? Empathy is going to happen and it's going to influence decision making. It's just a natural part of our, our decision making process and the judgments that we make. The real choice is whether we want to actively try to limit empathy, 
or whether we want to strive to expand it in ways that mitigate as best as possible all of those biases that they cite. And their argument is we shouldn't even do, we should avoid it because of those biases. Um, but my argument is that trying to limit empathy or let's ignore it would make it extremely difficult to make the kinds of decisions and judgments that we need to make in a democracy in a way that would really truly give equal consideration to all citizens. That is, we need to try and make it better because it's the only option that we have. And so we ought to strive through various ways. And I talk about some of these in the book and others have talked them about them as well, to increase the likelihood that whoever's making decisions in a democracy should engage this process of empathy as thoroughly as possible. And that's the only real way we can get towards, we can achieve understanding. So empathy is going to happen whether we want it to or not, let's try to make it better. A third argument that I make in defense of uh, empathy relates to Bloom's enumeracy critique. And I think this is actually a pretty easy argument to make. And that is that, remember he says that this we cannot empathize with large numbers of people and empathy focuses our attention on specific individuals and we can't use it to, to make these larger decisions. Uh, but most of the work that I've seen and a lot of the, some of the work that I've seen, right? Demonstrates, uh, and my own, I guess, instinct here, demonstrates that when you empathize with an individual, you can often then that spreads to the rest of, of the group of which that individual is a part. And there's evidence of this, for example, Batson and his colleagues, the various people uh, that Bloom cites to demonstrate that there are these problems with empathy, right? And other groups have demonstrated that when you induce empathy for, towards specific members of a stigmatized group, for example, a woman with AIDS and a homeless man, this was in 1997, right? That then people's general attitudes towards the group of which that individual is a part also demonstrate less bias. And they even showed it to some degree, although not as well, but to some degree to a convicted murderer. That is, once you empathized with a convicted murderer, or they induced you to empathize with a convicted murderer, people seem to even have slightly less negative opinions about convicted murderers. So I think, when the, the process of empathy happens, right, this, this, you empathize with particular individuals, I do think oftentimes we have evidence that that then applies to the larger groups. And I think that's really important when we think about a democracy where oftentimes we've had inequality um, and we can see examples where that happens. I do think that the strongest critique so far of the ones that I've discussed is the projection critique. And, and projection bias is a real thing and it does happen and it's a legitimate concern and I, I think Scudder is right to push us to be aware of this problem of projection <clears throat> but the question is how do we mitigate that I, as I said this is going to happen and, and I think it even happens not just on the affective level it happens on cognitive levels as well we think about arguments that make sense to us um, and we tend to listen to other people and we might project on what they're thinking not just what they're feeling and so I think what we have to do when it comes to projection bias is not get rid of empathy altogether because of this, this possibility. I, don't, I think that instead what we have to do is create institutions and create structures and create education in ways that will hopefully be able to mitigate it against this projection bias. And one of the easiest ways is, is to give people a voice. Uh, if people have a voice, they're more likely to say, no, you aren't understanding what I'm saying, right? And so deliberation provides the, the very opportunity to go against that projection. Whereas if we get rid of deliberation or we move away from thinking about deliberation in this sort of way, I argue, that is probably gonna make projection much more likely and probably gonna have much more pernicious effects. So those are some of my initial defenses uh, against this, against the critiques of empathy. Um, and now the coda, even more problems. So I don't know who this is yet. Um, as I was preparing this talk and as I was working on this paper, I got uh, a request from a journal editor to review an article uh, called Empathy, the, the Empathy Dilemma. 
So I don't know who's writing this. It's a group of people, I know that because they use the plural uh, pronouns, but they raise some other important concerns and I thought I'd at least mention them and I'm not sure if I have a response yet, but I, I, I wanna talk about it. It might be very interesting, I think, to this group in particular. So they argue there's a dilemma. Um, and the dilemma revolves around two horns. The first horn is very, very similar to the charges of bias that are raised by Bloom and Scudder. Uh, most people empathize with those who are like them. We have greater and greater siloization and polarization um, in media, media consumption, you know, polarization and siloization. This is going to be a serious problem. But this is something I think that relates to many of the other concerns I've talked about. The second argument, though, and this is an important one, I think, is about epistemic injustice. And they argue that the uh, only way to overcome the problems with empathy is to place a burden of communicating effectively on already marginalized people, thus risking epistemic injustice. And they identify five ways in which this might be true. First, they argue language mediated empathy in the context of public deliberation impose significant burdens because it requires the affected parties to express and themselves and describe their experiences through personal narratives in a suitably rich way to motivate the imagination of others. So they have this burden to be effective in, in giving their empathy. Second, they argue, drawing on Miranda Fricker, that context of entrenched social equality, members of oppressed or socially marginalized groups may not be able to articulate their experience because it might even remain opaque and unintelligible to themselves. Third, they point out that in the public sphere, uh, there are multifarious and different and uh, sometimes intersecting communicative exchanges. Um, and therefore, some people are going to have more opportunities, depending on who, who the speaker is addressing, their situation, uh, to provide for a, uh, an opportunity to, to have people empathize with them. Fourth, they maintain that speakers may be able to communicate intelligibly and convey their experience, but may not choose to do so. They may not want to do so for privacy or other strategic reasons. And finally, they say exchanges characterized by inequality that require language, language mediated empathic imagining places additional burdens to educate dominant or privileged others about their situation. So the shifting of burden onto this, uh, these already marginalized groups. Now, in the end, the authors do say their aim is not to discount the role of empathy. Uh, they think it might be a complementary to, to you know, deliberative exchanges and complementary in a democratic system, especially across differences. But they also don't really offer a solution to the dilemma they, they arrive, they raise, because, quote, they don't think there's a ready solution in social and political contexts uh, in, marked by entrenched historical uh, structural injustice and inequality. Um, so I guess in, in response what I still may not understand and, and we'll see as this this paper may be eventually published um, how we can address those serious you know concerns about epistemic justice while still overcoming the very marginalization the authors identify so if I'm right my argument is is that the process of empathy is is the best way to overcome marginalization um, and I think history kind of bears that out in many ways. It, it's not always been the kind of, uh, you know, cognitively oriented argumentation that has tended to overcome marginalization. And it seems to me that many of the same concerns they raise uh, would also apply just as easily to what I'm initially terming non-empathy oriented argumentation, right? We all know our Aristotle, right? It's not just pathos that could create the same kinds of issues that they raise about epistemic injustice. Um, because it takes, you know, individuals that are willing to go forward to take a legal case, for example, right? And what if they don't want to? Um, and I also wonder maybe perhaps if the one, from the one many phenomenon will help, help overcome this dilemma. That is that it does not require, this does not require that every single member of a marginalized group Right, engage in 
the process such that we are able to see the process of empathy occur. It, in fact, it oftentimes it are representative members of the group that are willing to do that or that suffer that evoke the kind of empathy that's necessary for us to give the consideration that a democracy needs. I'm not sure that's a sufficient response to the epistemic injustice problem. Um, I need to think about this more. This, is, this happened very recently, but those are at least my initial thoughts. Uh, and I'd love to hear if anyone else uh, has anything else or maybe agree that the epistemic injustice problem is, is not overcomable and that therefore we can't really uh, do maybe a strong defense of empathy. Thank you. Um, sorry, I had to get my uh, video going again, um, and I have to turn the video off.